Okay, I believe that we're live, and we even have Matt Jackson showing up. And a cat. Where's the cat going? Don't let it go. Cat, come back. Kevin, you're uh, unmute yourself. What's the uh, what's the name of the cat? Kevin. The cat's name is Pippin. Pippin. Uh, is he a uh, is he a sort of a uh, an extensor form guy or a normal form guy? What what what's Pippin? Uh, I think he's he's more of a social choice guy. He, he doesn't like thinking too much about incentives. Yeah, I didn't know that cat was that social, so that's good to know. Hey, Matt. Yes. You made it. I did. I did. So it's wonderful. Uh, a, a little bit of uh, technical difficulty, but it's overcome here. All right, everybody. So we're we're kicking it off, and this is going to be a fairly short hangout. But is this an opportunity to show you that we're flesh and blood, and uh, and that uh, uh, just an opportunity to get a little interactivity going on. And let me just kick this off by uh, uh, by explaining a little bit about the technological experiment we're doing in this class. So, as some of you know, we started uh, our lectures on uh, game theory on a different platform on Coursera that has been around a little longer, and um, we taught twice our basic game theory course that some of you have taken there. And uh, we've decided to experiment with this new one um, simply because we think it's very healthy to experiment with multiple platforms. Uh, we at Stanford and uh, Kevin at, uh, at British Columbia uh, th th think that it's very important for the academic experiment to be um, multi-platform. Uh, multi and so we're, we tried this one, and we've all uh, take, uh, paid a little price because it's a newer platform, and we ourselves weren't as familiar with it, and the feature set is not the same. So there were some initial hiccups, and uh, just so you know, behind the scenes, we've been working very hard to uh, try to overcome both our own uh, limitations and also... Uh, some misunderstandings, perhaps, uh, with you all that were created. Uh, I think we have a good rhythm going now, although still some features we would like aren't here. Other features are this platform itself. It's called uh, Course Builder. It's built by Google, and it's hosted here at Stanford. This platform is evolving. Stanford has another platform, class to go that is now being harmonized with a platform called edX. And we expect to be able to uh, experiment with multiple platforms. And in the coming few years, we think we'll see a lot of uh, evolution here. So we're all part of this experiment. We're making, uh, honestly, a very big effort to make it work. And we appreciate your patience with things that are sometimes not as smooth as they could be. Anyway, um, here we are. Uh, we want to introduce ourselves. I'm Yoav Shoham from Stanford. I'm a computer scientist. Uh, and uh, I sort of uh, worked in logic for about a decade and then game theory for another decade. And um, so uh, that's me. And maybe, uh, Matt, you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Uh, so I'm a professor of economics, and I've been working in mechanism design and implementation and game theory for several decades and on social networks a lot recently and I also work on uh, areas of social choice and uh, political economy so various things are associated with the course. Kevin. Hi, I'm, uh, I'm Kevin. I'm uh, also a computer scientist. I uh, work in artificial intelligence on both game theory, mechanism design, and also on uh, optimization algorithms. And uh, I guess I'm a young guy, so I've been in game theory from the beginning. <laughs> um, so, um, Kevin, do you want to say, uh, there's, there's not much to say uh, content-wise about the forum uh, activities, but maybe if you can make a, some comments about what we've, what we've seen going on? 
Sure. So yeah, I've been uh, keeping a pretty close eye on the forums, and uh, generally, I'm I'm pretty happy with how things are going. I think all of you are doing a really great job of answering each other's questions and also asking some really intelligent questions. Uh, if the forums are any indication of your experiences, it seems that by and large, um, most of you are not all getting stuck on on some you know same thing in the class. It seems to be going really pretty smoothly. Most of the questions that I see are about um, pretty specific issues and individual homework questions, and they're all kind of different. So it seems like people are just carefully going into the homeworks and having natural questions. So uh, that all seems great. Um, there's one question that I just saw today that, uh, although it's kind of a recent one that hasn't gotten too much follow-up, I, I think it's worth uh, briefly commenting on. Um, that's somebody who was talking about feeling like it would have been good if there had been more examples in the second week of the class. And uh, just finding the second week in particular to be pretty abstract. And I, I think that makes a lot of sense. I can see why somebody might feel that way. And I guess I just wanted to point out that in sense, the material that we're going to cover in week three and week four really are, in effect, our examples for week two. So really, the stuff in week two is kind of background that lets us talk about mechanism design. And really, the rest of the course is going to be thinking in more detail about mechanism design and with a lot more examples about that. So hopefully, if you're finding uh, the material in week two to be pretty abstract, hang in there, you're making an investment that's going to pay off in weeks three and four. Yeah. But of course, this is a theoretical uh, class, right? Let's uh, set the right expectations there. Um, Matt, um, I don't know if there's anything in particular you wanted to comment on. One question that we got online by somebody who couldn't join was they, um, and again, I couldn't uh, speak to them to see exactly uh, why they asked the question, but they, they, were, they seemed to think that in some way uh, what uh, they call the Condorcet method, uh, by which really the Condorcet condition, they thought that posed a counterexample to the muller satisweight impossibility theorem for some reason. Um, do you want to comment on that or on anything else? Um, I'm not sure I see the connection directly between that and the counter. I mean, I'm not sure how it, the theorem's true, so I don't see. The, I, I'm not sure I understand the question you just asked. Okay, I think uh, yeah. Well, I, I it's totally unfair of 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 my not really understanding it well and just throwing it at you. I thought, I thought, uh, I I I think that perhaps uh, the the gentleman ha had the impression that. A Condorcet winner always exists, oh, and okay. since it's not dictatorial, that may be a counterexample. But of course, right, right, right. Uh, they they may not exist. Okay. Yeah. No. Sure. I, I guess you know when you look at all the impossibility results that we've covered in the course, the um, Arrow's theorem, Buhler's satterthwaite and also Gibbard's satterthwaite theorem, all of those rely on full domains of preferences. And what's really critical in terms of the proofs of those theorems is that all the people in the society can be in conflict with each other. So we can have situations where you can have different orderings for different people. And uh, you want to mute that guy's mic? Yeah. Uh, Apurva, 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 thanks for joining us, but yeah. please mute your mic for now, OK? Can you um, do that, so, please? so the, the idea of having conflict in preferences is, is essential to those proofs and, and getting triples where you have different people, anything winning by pairwise majority is often a critical step in each one of those proofs. So indeed, if you, if you have a restricted domain where a Condorcet winner always exists, then you can avoid all three of the impossibility results, uh, in fact. So, so it would be a counterexample if you restrict the domain far enough so that you have Condorcet winners always existing. That would be true. Um, everybody, uh, both Shiva and Apurna, Apurna, uh, Apurva who joined us, please make sure your mics are switched off for now until we call on you. And why don't we do this now? We have a full slate of visitors, students, uh, partners here. Why don't we go and have a quick chat with each of you. Please tell us your name uh, and, uh, and where you're from and very and succinctly any questions you have or comments you'd like to make? And let's go from right to left, starting with uh, Ulrich. Uh, probably mispronounced some of your names. I apologize. Amosu? 
why don't you unmute and uh, speak up? Uh, okay, my name is Olori Kamusu, and uh, I'm in St. Louis, Missouri, and uh, I'm uh, I'm just listening, and I want to know more about game theory. I don't have any question for now. Why Why did you take this class? Uh, I'm thinking of uh, going for a PhD in uh, economics, but uh, I decided to use uh, uh, the chance to learn for without attending any school, just be on Coursera and uh, take all of the classes if possible. Okay, so thank, thank you for joining us. Please mute your mic again and let's move on. Sriram, hi there. Why don't you unmute? Yeah, so this is my second foray, uh, the earlier one being the Game Theory Part 1 earlier this year. So I'm a social scientist. I've taught for a number of years in, you know, uh, in Singapore. And then um, right now, I mean, um, I'm sort of, I'm a consultant. I have my own uh, business. And I'm interested in seeing how game theory can be profitably applied to analyzing applied problems. And one of my questions was, is there, has anyone uh, used such concepts to analyze uh, healthcare settings, you know, interactions in healthcare settings, for example. And I tried Google searches. The only thing I found out was, uh, you know, agent-based role modeling, you know, kind of uh, where you use software to build models of doctors, nurses, but I did not see any of the game theory lingo coming up in the, in the few references that I was able to garner. The second area of application is, you know, my own specialty is social psychology. And uh, clearly, uh, you know, they're always talking about attitudes, beliefs, and so on. But you know, clearly, many situations are constrained by strategic considerations, and uh, uh, clearly, uh, you know, ideas from game theory are very much uh, you know applicable. And probably behavioral economics is an area where they're already doing it. But uh, yeah. so my sort of uh, the reason I'm taking it is just to understand how game theorists think, so that so that I can think a little bit like them, and then maybe uh, introduce these areas, uh, ideas in some of my applications uh, as well as uh, some of my uh, you know, thinking as well. Yeah. So very impressive. Sure. And where are you from? So I did my undergraduate at IIT Madras long, 30 years back. Was it 30? Uh, almost 30 years ago. And then I did a PhD in psychology at Eugene, Oregon. And that was a place where Kahneman and, I mean, uh, uh, Kahneman was a visitor. I think Slovak was in the Eugene uh, Decision Sciences. Uh, so I got, uh, you know, I was in sort of atmosphere, and then I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. So I uh, went to Singapore, taught for uh, a dozen years in, um, you know, National University there in psychology, and then uh, I got interested in the implicit association test, which is a method for uh, measuring implicit or unconscious associations. Uh, there was a, there's a chap in um, Seattle, you know, say Washington, Tony Greenwald. So I worked with him for a couple of years, and we invented something new. And then for the last eight years or so, I've been running Project Implicit, which is a website at Harvard, which uh, dishes out these tests. And we use the website infrastructure to host other people's research as well. So, uh, okay. so I, I developed the consulting side of the business. And now I have my own website. So I remain a consultant to Project Implicit. And I used to be a research scientist at the UVA, University of Virginia. So my site is called implicit.com, brand new, just a few weeks old. I m p l i s c i dot com, and you can check it out. Okay, Sriram, Sriram, yeah. I, I'm glad to give you the uh, the platform here to discuss it. But just in the interest of time, let's move on. And yeah. uh, I, I understand that now that we stole Al Roth from Harvard, uh, that Sriram is not on top of uh, medical applications in intern matching and kidney exchange, but would that be a good thing to touch on, yeah, Kevin absolutely. or uh, Matt? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I guess as you have just uh, stated, what one one area of, of huge application of of game theory recently has been in matching markets, and in particular, you know, trying to assign kidneys to patients. So, if you have a whole series of of kidneys, people who need kidney transplants, and you have uh, people who have donors associated with them, then you have to match these people up in, in ways that are compatible with people's incentives and 
um, and and so there you have to design these markets very carefully. And and so Al Roth has been a, a pioneer in, in engineering this and, and actually getting the medical community to to adopt kidney exchanges where you actually have cycles of of individuals. I think the largest one now in, involves more than ten. 10 different patients at a time. So that's been an area. Another area that, that actually has a lot of applications of game theory is in adverse selection and insurance. So Obamacare, for instance, um, was actually designed partly understanding the game theory and understanding the incentives that people have to take insurance or not take insurance. So the mandates that are part of that program were designed understanding that, that healthier people have less of an incentive to take up the, the insurance and that kind of adverse selection causes problems if you don't structure the contracts in a certain way. So, so actually, he had a lot of input from from uh, economists who use game theory models to try and predict what the different uh, usages and, and take ups in in the insurance would be. So, so that's actually a very uh, recent example of an application of, of game theory. All right, let's move along. And uh, Shiran, please remember to mute your mic back in. And Shuang, why didn't you unmute? Tell us the correct pronunciation of your name and where you're from and what you want to discuss. Okay, uh, my name is Shuang and I'm also in Singapore now. Uh, I'm, I'm a graduate student in, in industrial engineering. Uh, so I want to uh, see mechanism design is new for me and what I want to see whether there are some things I can use uh, in, in, my, in my own project. Uh, and uh, my question is, although like, uh, actually my question is uh, for the week two, I, I think we really need uh, some specific example. Uh, for, 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 for example, uh, the implementation in, do, in do, dominant strategies. I mean, it's, it's, it's not easy to understand it, so is it possible to have some easy uh, Example to explain. I mean, Kevin, uh, it was a little hard for me to hear, but you seem to be our example uh, guy today. Do you want to handle this? Sure. Yeah. I, I also a little hard for me to hear, but I think I got it. So, so uh, what I uh, what I think uh, Swan was saying is that the uh, week two was was hard to understand with examples, and particularly the idea of implementation and dominant strategies. Um, so, so again, as I was saying before, I think really um, it, you're going to see more examples uh, as the, the course goes on. Right now, it, it, if there were great examples to give you in week two, we would have given them to you, but I think we need a little bit more background to give to you before examples become helpful. I mean, even if you watch the first video of uh, week three, just the taste video, it has four or five examples of mechanism design in that, so I think that might be a good thing to, to watch next. Um, but, uh, but, but let me tell you a little bit about implementation and dominant strategies. So uh, it sounds like you understood week one pretty well. So you know, week one is about voting. Uh, it's about making a, a, a social decision between uh, a group of people. So you have some social choice function um, that tries to um, adjudicate between uh, different people's preferences and choose something. And, and really the topic of mechanism design, the idea of implementation, is to say you want to do the same thing. You want to come up with some sort of voting rule that given information about everybody's preferences will make a choice, but you want this to work even when people are selfish, so even when people might lie. So if you have an implementation in dominant strategies, what that means is you would uh, everyone has the dominant strategy of revealing their information to the mechanism so that it can then run the social choice function. So this is kind of the, the thing that you would most want. It says, um, presuming you have some voting rule that makes sense, um, people uh, have the incentive to tell it the truth so that it would work the way that you want it to work. Um, one of the main reasons we don't give you examples of these things is uh, even in week two, we encounter a very strong negative result that says, uh, generally speaking, we, we actually can't do this kind of implementation. So we can't show you such a mechanism because we, we actually prove to you that no such mechanisms exist. And later on in the course, what we do is restrict the kinds of preferences people can have and show that in those kinds of cases, it is possible to, uh, 
to come up with, with implementations. All right. So, Shuang, if you don't mind, mute your mic back up. And Shiva, you're on. Everybody else, please make sure your mics are still muted. And Shiva, the floor is yours. Where are you from? Yeah. Hi. I am Shiva. I am from India. Uh, I am a student. I'm doing undergraduate studies in maths. Where? Uh, okay. India. No, where in India? It's a big country. Okay. Uh, I am doing uh, uh, MS in Aysar Pune. It is in Pune. Okay. Okay. And uh, uh, I took this class just out of interest in game theory and probably it will help me in my higher studies. Uh, okay. And do you have it? So one to uh, so Arrow's theorem says that if uh, so Arrow's theorem says that uh, if you have a social welfare function with some nice properties like weak Pareto efficiency and uh, independent independence of independence to irrelevant alternatives, then it is non it is dictatorial essentially. So uh, it actually I mean does this mean that the voting system is not fair or something like that? Because anyway we don't know the dictator. We don't know who is the dictator. Right? Does does that make you feel more comfortable? Uh, the fact that there's somebody pulling the strings, but you don't know who they are. So you, you're going to the election, and you vote, and you know that there's somebody out there who actually will decide, not you, but just because you don't know who they are, you feel better about it. Yeah, when no one feel no one knows who they are, then. I mean, even the dictator doesn't know that he is the dictator himself. So, why would that affect? Uh... So maybe, maybe there's a, a little bit misunderstanding about the application of the theorem to the real world. I mean, I think one implication of the re of the of the theorem is not that we actually have dictators, yeah. but but instead that that we violate the conditions of the theorem. So so generally, when we work with with if we look at the way that voting rules are are put into the real world, we most often we violate the independence of relevant alternatives. So so the way that things end up working out is we end up not having the conditions satisfied that Arrow's theorem puts forth. So Arrow said, look, if we, we, we would love to have all these conditions, but we get a dictator. And since we don't use dictatorial rules generally in democracies, then we end up violating the conditions. And so so usually what, what we violate is independence of relevant alternatives. We have systems that somehow where the agenda matters or, you know, so in the examples you saw in the course, you know, you, you get these kinds of, of uh, unpleasant uh, side effects that, that voting systems will tend to have in them. So the agendas matter. Um, we end up with cycles in, uh, in, in the, the outcomes. So we don't end, we don't end up with transitive uh, uh, outcomes, so there's, there can be various problems that we end up with, or we use something like board account, which violates independence of relevant alternatives. Okay, Matt, I think we just lost you, or at least I lost you. No, I'm still here, I think. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah, I yes. just I just stopped talking. <laughs> so that was, <laughs> but but it's an interesting, very nice. I mean, it's a question that you know I think Shiva is pointing to one thing. The Arrow's theorem is probably one of the most important theorems in the last uh, century in terms of social you know so, social sciences. And it's a deep theorem, right? And and it, it's led a lot of people to puzzle and to rethink how do we make collective decisions. So these are really important questions and ones that. You know, it's it's a it's a deep theorem, and and one that's well known for a good reason. By the way, somebody just decided to start mowing the lawn outside my office, <laughs> so, so I'm trying to mute the microphone. But if occasionally Matt and Kevin, if like now, if it's unbearable, let me know, and I'll turn I'll, I'll mute myself uh, again. So, but maybe it's a good time to move on, and we have two. Uh, dark people. So, uh, uh, Shiva, please mute your mic back up. 
and we have two dark people in the sense that they don't have good lighting. So, Hisham, uh, you're on. Please unmute yourself. If you possibly have a light to shine on yourself, that's good. Otherwise, we'll believe you. Hello, everybody. My name is Hisham. Uh, I am from uh, Egypt. Uh, I work as a software engineer in uh, wireless wireless protocol stacks uh, development. Uh, the reason I am taking this course is I am interested in, in uh, doing some uh, master program in probably in wireless communications or computer science. Uh, I would love to talk uh, a little bit about the applications, uh, but uh, a lot of people have uh, preceded me. So I think this is more than enough. I uh, I can't think I see that there's a lot of applications for game theory in different in a lot of fields. And uh, then I have one question uh, in the slide. Uh, so it is uh, in case the social function is dictatorial, and uh, maybe the dictator the dictator is is known already. Uh, is it possible that uh, the agents have uh, a dominant strategy? I, I, I can imagine that they will be somehow indifferent or uh, so the output will, will, their choice will not affect the output. So how come they have a dominant strategy? So yeah. uh, just, just to clarify, um, a, a, a social choice function is something that we discussed even before we discussed implementation, and uh, and uh, the, the dictatorialist uh, property applies even there. But you're right that when you speak about implementation, when you have a dictator, it has implications for implementation for all the, uh, in particular, for all the non-dictators. So Matt, I saw you were nodding your head there. Yes. Yeah. No. He's exactly right. I mean, it, it is a dominant strategy because you're completely indifferent. It, it, so once there's someone else is a dictator, then the other people have no say. So, so whatever truth is is just as good as any other strategy in that case. But you know we're working off the idea here that that dominance means uh, is in a weak sense. So you don't have a strategy which is strictly your best. It's just that it doesn't matter. So you're you're happy to tell the truth or to lie or do whatever in that case. Okay. Maybe it's a good opportunity. Yeah, I have one more question. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, does it mean uh, when we have uh, the truthful reporting of uh, preferences is uh, impossible if the C if C is not uh, dictatorial? Does the when the agents knows what uh, what other agents preferences, they will change their uh, their uh, their their uh, preferences or or this is yes yeah I think that's exactly the right interpretation is that. The theorem says if it's if it's not dictatorial, then somebody somewhere will have some manipulation they could make. So somebody somewhere would want to lie. There'd be some profile of preferences for which somebody would want to lie if if you end up satisfying the conditions of the theorem, but don't end up having a dicta dictator. Then basically you're going to have to violate the strategy proofness condition, and somebody won't have a dominant strategy at some some profile. Thank you. All right, let's move on. Hisham, please mute your mic, and we'll move on to uh, Camilo. Camilo, is there any way you can also shine a light on your face so we can see? I'm sure you're very good looking. Ah, no, now you have a, a, a light in the back of you. That's even worse. Never mind. Why don't you sit down and, oh, there you are. We see you now. Wonderful. Why don't you unmute? Where are you from? We can't hear you. You're muted. Uh, do you know how to unmute yourself? If you go to the upper right corner, there's a picture of a microphone. If you want to unmute yourself, maybe there. That working? Camilo, do you see the picture of the microphone in the upper right? Yeah, is it unmuted? We can't it looks, hear. It looks oh. like he's unmuted. It seems like Camila may be having some uh, technical problems. I wonder, Camila, if you could type your question to us. Okay, 
So Camilla, why don't you try to fix it either by typing or figuring out what's happening if your microphone will come back to you in a moment. But in the meanwhile, we'll move over and speak with Apurva. I see your picture. I don't see you. Oh, you're even moving. You're live. That's nice. So why don't you unmute on Purva and tell us where you're from and say something. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm from uh, India. I just finished my, uh, finished my undergraduate studies from uh, National Institute of Technology in Mechanical Engineering. The reason I took this course was uh, because I wanted to know how I can apply game theory in stock market because I have been uh, hired uh, as a market analyst in Futures First. Okay, um, Kevin, are you good? Are you good at uh, are, are you good at trading? And do you use a game theory for that? I have to confess, I was just typing to Camila to hear the question. Uh, okay. What what are, what are you answer? It sounds like you're. Uh, you're on uh, it. I I am always the skeptic. Uh, I always am so nervous about trying to use formal theories in something practical in particular in financial markets. Um, I believe that it works in very large block trading with a small number of traders and even there you want to uh, apply it with great caution. But uh, Matt, you, uh, you're close to all your, all your finance friends there in the uh, economics. They use uh, game theory when they advise uh, on trading. Yeah, they they look. I, I, you know, I, I, as in as we'll talk about in terms of auction design and other things, people worry very much about the platforms that are used for for various security markets, and a lot of thought goes into the design of those things. And people, main, one main thing that that the exchanges are worried about is manipulation by individuals. So it used to be, I, you know, I actually worked for the Chicago Mercantile Exchange for a while, and one thing we worried about a lot was what we call squeezes, where um, somebody would amass a huge amount of the of goods and then actually try and manipulate the markets by buying contracts. And so, as a market, we we tried to design things so that people couldn't squeeze the market, and we kept the the clearinghouse was given explicit instructions that were based on what kinds of strategies people would follow to try and manipulate markets to try and avoid it. So there are examples where where these things are, are used. And I think more than anything, as you all were saying, we didn't apply formal theorems, but we had some sense of, of what kinds of manipulations might be possible and what sorts of information people would need. And, and so the basic kinds of thinking that game theory gives you was quite useful, even if the specific formal theory wasn't. Is it fair to say, uh, Matt, that when uh when we look at the formal models of games and several equilibrium notions, that those serve as a directional, it sensitizes to the issues, but then we take that and apply a measure of uh, real world knowledge and common sense? Yes, I think that's exactly right. I mean, the real world is a lot messier than the examples we write down in the class, right? So, so there's all kinds of considerations that are extra and make the, the real situations a lot more complicated. But the game theory gives us basic ideas and some thinking that can help guide us in terms of what questions we ask and what things we think about, more so than giving us an answer, per se. And we'll probably get back to some of these issues when, when we discuss mechanism design and auctions, uh, so the, the design space will become more concrete, even though we won't explicitly speak about financial markets. Let's give uh, make one more try with Camillo. Uh, is there... Have you made progress on either typing or ah no for the moment I see this okay so I think we're well, good. Well, hold on. So Camilo introduces himself in the chat so we can uh, we we can pass on that Camilo's from Colombia but now living in Poland. Uh, he wanted to join the course because he's interested in refreshing his knowledge of game theory. He's in finances and international trade uh, and a business manager. And uh, I guess he just wanted to to come by and and listen to the chat. Colombia and Poland, so sort of on average he lives in Iowa or something like that? Um, anyway, uh, thanks for joining us. Um, you know, I think we're getting the close of this. Is this a way, like we said, a way to just get a little informal and uh, hear from a small fraction of you all, but anyway, 
a sample representation, and you get a you know an informal sense for us. Uh, before we sign off, uh, Kevin or Matt, anything we we want to say? Um, no, it's great to have everybody, and uh, it's exciting to to be working at, on a a course. I think now that's that's you know one that is moving at a more advanced level and. And still seeing people quite active and full of questions. It's a great set of questions and look forward to more. Where's Tippin, Kevin? <laughs> oh, there he is. And on that feline note, I think we'll sign off. Thank you all. Hang in there. We'll talk again soon. Bye. Bye bye. Take care, folks.